Ten o'clock had struck, and Manor Farm was just settling down for the night, or ought to have been settling down at any rate. Mr Jones, the farmer, had made his way up to bed, a little drunk, as usual. But all through the farm buildings, there was a stirring and a fluttering as the bedroom lights went out. The animals were creeping out of their stalls. Word had gone round during the day that old Major, the prize middle white boar, had had a wonderful dream last night and now wished to address the other animals on a matter of great importance. At one end of the big barn, on a sort of platform, Major was already sitting on his bed of straw under a lantern that hung from a beam. The hens perched themselves on the window sills. The pigeons fluttered up to the rafters. The cows and sheep lay down behind the pigs and began chewing the cud. The two cart horses, Boxer and Clover, came in together, walking very slowly and setting down their vast hairy hooves with great care, lest there should be any chickens or ducklings concealed in the straw. Molly, the pretty white mare who drew Mr Jones's trap on market days, took a place near the front and began flirting with her white mane, hoping to draw attention to the red ribbons it was plaited with. Then came Muriel, the goat, and last of all came Benjamin, the donkey, with his long ears and his grizzled, obstinate-looking muzzle, the oldest animal on the farm and the worst-tempered. Comrades, quiet, quiet, quiet everyone. He's starting. I do not believe, comrades, that I shall be with you for many months more. And before I die, I feel it my duty to pass on to you such wisdom as I have acquired. Now, comrades, what is the nature of this life of ours? Let us face it. Our lives are miserable, laborious and short. No animal in England knows the meaning of happiness or leisure after he is a year old. No animal in England is free. Why is it then that we continue in this miserable condition? Who is it that steals the produce of our labour from us? Tell me, comrades. What is the worst enemy we animals have to contend with? Please. <laughs> no, comrade, no. There are worse things than fleas, believe me. The whip. Now that is nearer the mark. I will answer my own question, comrades. Man is our enemy. We are poor because the produce of our labour is stolen from us by human beings. There is the answer to all our problems. Remove man from the scene and the root cause of hunger and overwork has vanished forever. Man is the only animal that consumes without producing. You cows, how many gallons of milk have you given during the year? And what has happened to that milk which should have been breeding up sturdy calves? Every drop of it has gone down the throat of our enemies. How many eggs ever hatched into chickens? And, and you, Clover, where are your foals? Each was sold at a year old and you will never see one of them again. And even the miserable lives that we lead are not allowed to reach their natural span. Think of the slaughterhouse, comrades. <laughs> Think of the butcher's shop. <laughs> to that horror we all must come. Cows, sheep, <laughs> pigs, hens, everyone. Even the horses and the dogs are no better off. You, boxer, the very day that these great muscles of yours lose their power, Jones will sell you to the knacker, who will cut your throat and boil you down for the foxhounds. I never thought of it like that. It's well. Jones who robs us of everything. Jones makes us work, and Jones keeps us hungry. Down with Jones! Down, down with, with Jones. Jones! Down with Jones! Death to Jones! Comrades, 
It is not enough to say death to Jones. Death to humanity must be our motto. Death to mankind. That is my message. I do not know when this rebellion will come. It might be in a week or in a hundred years, but I know, as surely as I see this straw beneath my feet, that sooner or later, justice will be done. <laughs> Never listen when they tell you that man and the animals have a common interest, that the prosperity of one is the prosperity of the other. Man serves the interests of no creature except himself. Whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. And remember, too, that in fighting against man, you must not come to resemble him. No animal must ever live in a house or sleep in a bed or wear clothes or drink alcohol or smoke tobacco or touch money or engage in trade. All the habits of man are evil. And above all, no animal must ever tyrannize over his own kind. All animals are equal. All animals are equal. All animals are equal. And now, comrades, I will tell you about my dream of last night. It was a dream of the earth as it will be when man has vanished. Many years ago, when I was a little pig, my mother and the other sows used to sing an old song of which they knew only the tune and the first three words. Last night, it came back to me in my dream. And what is more, the words also came back, words I am certain, which were sung by the animals of long ago and have been lost to memory for generations. I will sing you that song now, comrades. I am old and my voice is hoarse, but when I have taught you the tune, you can sing it better for yourselves. It is called Beasts of England. <coughs> Beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, beasts of every land and clime, hearken to my joyful tidings of the golden future time. Soon or late the day is coming, tyrant man shall be your throne. And the fruitful fields of England shall be trod by beasts alone. Albert. <clears throat> Albert. <clears throat> Wake up. <clears throat> what are them animals up to? <clears throat> Can't you hear the noise they're making? <clears throat> oh, that's fit to waken the dead. <clears throat> Oh, let's come over him. <laughs> Sounds like... <sighs> Lummy, there's a fox in the yard. Here, where'd I put that gun? Uh, here she is. Three nights later, old Major the Boar died peacefully in his sleep. His body was buried at the foot of the orchard. That was in early March. During the next three months, there was much secret activity. The work of teaching and organising the others fell naturally upon the pigs, who were generally recognised as being the cleverest of the animals. Pre-eminent among the pigs were two young boars named Snowball and Napoleon, whom Mr Jones was rearing up for sale. All the other male pigs on the farm were porkers. The best known among them was a small, fat pig named Squealer, with very round cheeks, twinkling eyes, nimble movements and a shrill voice. 
these three had elaborated Major's teaching into a complete system of thought, to which they gave the name Animalism. Several nights a week, after Mr Jones was asleep... Totally contrary to the spirit of animalism, comrades. Freedom is knowledge of necessity. Let me explain. What I want to know is, will there still be sugar after the rebellion? <sighs> Molly, you think of nothing except yourself. No, certainly not. When we're in control of this farm, we'll have to be self-supporting. We have no means of making sugar here. Quite right, Napoleon. Hmm. Besides, don't you know sugar is bad for your teeth? <laughs> Shall I still be allowed to wear ribbons in my name, Snowball? <sighs> Comrade Snowball... Those ribbons you are so devoted to are the badge of slavery. Can you not understand that liberty is more important than ribbons? Yes, I suppose so. Horses do not need sugar. We can work better on oats and hay. As for the ribbons, I, I had not thought of it like that before, but Comrade Snowball is right. I, Boxer, shall never wear ribbons again. <laughs> The only animal on the farm who refused to become excited about the rebellion was Benjamin, the donkey. In winter, there is the cold. In summer, there are the flies. There is never quite enough to eat, and there is always work. I was working before any of you were born, and I shall be working after you were all dead. Donkeys live a long time. None of you has ever seen a dead donkey. But you do believe, comrade, that the rebellion is going to happen? Everything happens sooner or later. On the other hand, nothing ever changes, except names, boxer. Work is not an evil. I think that when Jones is gone, there will be more food, but there will not be less work. I have worked hard for Jones, and I will work twice as hard for the rebellion. <laughs> my brain is not good, but my muscles are good. Count on me. And me. And me. And me. And me. And me. Now, as it turned out, the rebellion was achieved much earlier and more easily than anyone had expected. June came, and the hay was almost ready for cutting. On Midsummer's Eve, which was a Saturday, Mr Jones went into Willingdon, the neighbouring market town, and got so drunk at the Red Lion that he did not come back till midday on Sunday. His men had milked the cows in the early morning and then gone out rabbiting. When Mr Jones got back, he immediately went to sleep on the drawing-room sofa with the news of the world over his face, so that when evening came, the animals were still unfed. At last, they could stand it no longer. Why should we put up with this? <laughs> said the cock. We work for him and he starves us. <laughs> If he won't feed us, we'll feed ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go down to the meadow and eat the hay. Yeah. A cow suggested, but a pigeon declared... No! I know where there's better food than that. Huh? The store shed. <sighs> Come on! To the store shed, everybody! Yeah. Here we are. Open the door. It's locked! Break it in, somebody. One of you cows... Get your horn into that crack. Yeah. There, there, that's right. Go. Oh, 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 look at all that food. Oh, 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 look at that pile of oats. Oh, 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 break up oh, those bags of meal. Thanks. Oh, 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 Help yourselves, everybody. Oh, 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 But just as the starving animals were in the act of helping themselves, Jones and his four men appeared in the yard. Oh, no. Here comes Jones! They got whips! They got whips! Stand firm, comrades! We'll beat them whips or no whips! Out of it, quick, you devils! He hit me! He hit me! Run, comrades! Run! Every animal for himself! No! This is our chance! Forward, comrades! Forward! In the name of the rebellion! Death to Jones! Well, what's come over him? I've never seen him take one like this before! Go on, you! Don't stand looking at him! Give him the weapon! You can't do nothing with him, sir! Seems like they're... Here! Gonna keep off, you devil, you! Come on, comrades! Don't let them rest! Here! They're coming after us again! I'm getting out of there! Comrades, the 
to them. Don't stop till we've driven them from the fire. The animals chased Jones and his men out onto the road and slammed the five-barred gate behind them. And so, almost before they knew what was happening, the rebellion had been successfully carried through. Jones was expelled, and the manor farm was theirs. We've won! And now, comrades, back to the farm we go and wipe out every sign that human beings have ever lived there. The, the harvest room! The harvest room! Bring out the instruments of torture! Here are the birds! The nose rings! The castrating knives! The dog chains! Fling the whole lot of them down the well! Rings! Rings! Blinkers! Collars! Halters! Away they go! Here are the worst of all. The whips and rocks. Onto the fire with them! The whips are burning! Look at the whips burning! Look at the whips burning! Those degrading ribbons that Jones used to decorate the horses' manes with. Burn them! With the rest. Oh, must we burn the ribbons, all of them? Ribbons, Molly, are clothes. <laughs> all animals should go naked. Oh. My hat shall go on the fire, too. So there. Yeah. What should we do with the farmhouse, Snowball? The farmhouse must be torn. Um, the farmhouse is a very desirable residence, comrades. Now, if we were to put it to but proper no use... animal must ever live in it. I feel sure of that. No, no. no. We, we must, must never, never live, live in it. What did Major say? Never to live in a house. No. I have it. The farmhouse shall be preserved as a museum. <laughs> it will be a reminder to us of the folly and luxury in which human beings lived. Agreed. Agreed. The farmhouse Agreed. shall be a museum. And the farm must have a new name. The manor farm is too human. The new name must show it for what it is. The only farm in the whole country, in the whole of England, owned and operated by animals. It should be the farm of the animals. Mm. Beast farm. Mm. Animal manor. Huh. Animal farm. So be it, Napoleon. Animal farm. Hearken to my joyful tidings of the golden future time. Soon or late the day is coming, tyrant man shall be your throne, and the fruitful fields of England shall be trod by beasts alone. Comrades, it is half past six and we have a long day ahead of us. Today we begin the hay harvest, but there is another matter that must be attended to first. I must tell you that during the past three months, we pigs have taught ourselves the art of reading and writing. We have also, by very careful study, succeeded in reducing the principles of animalism to seven commandments. We propose now to inscribe these seven commandments on the wall of the big barn. Once written, they will form the unalterable law by which every animal on this farm must live. Oh, agreed. 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 agreed! Bring a pot of white paint and a ladder. Comrade Snowball shall write the commandments. He is the best at writing. <laughs> Soon the commandments were written on the tarred wall in great white letters that could be read 30 yards away. Now I'll read them out. One. Whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. <laughs> two. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings, is a friend. Agreed, agreed. 
three. No animal shall wear clothes. Four. No animal shall sleep in a bed. Five. No animal shall drink alcohol. Six. No animal shall kill any other animal. Seven. All animals are equal. All, All animals, animals are, are equal. equal. And now, comrades, to the hayfield. Let us make it a point of honor to get in the harvest in shorter time than Jones and his men could do. But the cows had not been milked for 24 hours, and their udders were almost bursting. After a little thought, the pigs sent for buckets and milked the cows fairly successfully, their trotters being well adapted to this task. Soon, there were three buckets of frothing, creamy milk, at which many of the animals looked with considerable interest. What is going to happen to all that milk? Jones used sometimes to mix some of it in the hen's mash. <laughs> Never mind the milk, comrades. That will be attended to. The harvest is more important. Comrade Snowball shall lead the way. I will follow in a few minutes. Forward, comrades! The hay is waiting. So the animals trooped down to the hayfield to begin the harvest. And when they came back in the evening, it was noted that the milk had disappeared. All that day, and every day for a week to come, how they toiled and how they sweated to get the hay in. The work with implements which had been designed for human beings, was not easy or simple. But the pigs were so clever that they could find a way round any difficulty. And as for the horses, they knew every inch of the field. In the end, their efforts were rewarded. It was the biggest harvest the farm had ever had, and not an animal stole as much as a mouthful. All through that summer, the farm ran like clockwork. The pigs, with their cleverness, and Boxer, with his tremendous cart horse muscles, were equal to anything. Boxer had been a hard worker even in Jones's time, but now he seemed more like three horses than one. His answer to every difficulty, every setback, was I will work harder. On Sundays, there was no work. After breakfast, the green flag, which had been chosen as the emblem of the farm, it was really an old tablecloth of Mrs Jones's, which Snowball had found in the harness room, was run up the flagstaff. And then the animals trooped into the big barn for a general assembly known as the meeting, which ended with the singing of Beasts of England. And the afternoon was given up to study and recreation. Snowball busied himself with organising what he called animal committees. He formed the Egg Production Committee for the hens, the Clean Tails League for the cows, the Wild Comrades Re-Education Committee to tame the rats and rabbits, and the Whiter Wool Movement for the sheep. On the whole, these projects were a failure. The cat joined the re-education committee and was very active in it for some days. She was seen sitting on a roof and talking to some sparrows who were just out of her reach. She was telling them that all animals were now comrades and that any sparrow who chose could come and perch on her paw. But the sparrows kept their distance. Snowball also instituted classes in reading and writing, and these were a great success. By the autumn, almost every animal on the farm was literate in some degree. Comrade Snowball, I know the whole alphabet now, but I cannot read words. Um, Muriel can read words. Benjamin can read quite well, but he says there's nothing worth reading. Um, Box has only been able to learn A, B, C, D, and the sheep and the ducks and the hens cannot get beyond a B. Also, uh, Comrade, they say they've not been able to learn the commandments by heart. Uh, don't you think you could shorten the commandments in some way so that everyone can learn them? Hmm, let me see. I think it can be done. Ah, yes, Clover, I have it. 
Now listen. Four legs good, two legs bad. There you have the essential principle of animalism in six words. What about us? We have two legs. Uh, comrades, comrades. A bird's wing is an organ of propulsion and not of manipulation. It should therefore be regarded as a leg. The distinguishing mark of man is the hand with which he does all his mischief. Four legs good, two legs bad. Four legs good, two legs bad. Excellent, comrades. Keep the maxim in mind and you will be completely safe against human influences. Four legs good, two legs bad. Four legs good, two legs bad. Four legs good, two legs bad. It happened that Jessie and Bluebell had whelped soon after the hay harvest, giving birth between them to nine sturdy puppies. As soon as they were weaned, Napoleon took them away from their mothers, saying that he himself would be responsible for their education. He took them up into a loft, which could only be reached by a ladder, and there kept them in such seclusion that the farm soon forgot their existence. That's a funny setup over at Jones, isn't it? Can't last, of course. All them brutes will be starving long before winter comes on. Bound to. What do I mean to say? It's against nature, ain't it? But uh, look here. When them animals chase Jones out, we all said they'd be starving inside of a fortnight, didn't we? Well, they ain't starved yet. No, but it ain't winter yet. Yeah, but look here. Supposing we was the... Oh, here, give us a stone. Get off, you devil! You! It's all over the place, that tune is. If you ask me, it's time it was put a stop to. It wouldn't take much to do it. Just half a dozen of us go up there with the cart whips and maybe a gun or two, and, and then we yeah, creep. But what I did think, and this is between you and I, mind you, I did think as it mightn't be a bad idea to leave them animals in possession for a bit. Suppose Jones finds us he can't get them out, what'll he do? Sell the farm and sell cheap. We can't do nothing else. And it's a nice little property the man of farm is. Yeah, there was a lot of us thought that. But then it wasn't to be expected as them animals would make a job of it. But from what I hear, uh, don't uh, pass this on, of course. From what I hear, they ain't doing so bad. They got their A in like Christians. Now, now that won't do, see. It sets a bad example. Suppose our animals get to trying it on. What I say is, we all got to hang together. After all, we all live off animals, don't we? Yeah. Got to keep a firm hand on them, of course. And to keep them under, we've got to keep them ignorant. Once let them find out as they can do without us, then where'd we be? The sooner Jones gets his farm back, the better for us all. Well... Maybe you're right. That's settled, then. I'll have a word with one or two of the others and fix a day. We won't half teach those beggars a lesson. Just let me get in among them with a whip and there'll be bloody murder. OK, I'll give you a hand. Are you coming to church this morning? All right. Up there, bell's been ringing these ten minutes. Come on, we'd best step lively. But the animals were aware of these developments. They had their spies and sympathisers everywhere, and they were not surprised when one day, early in October, a flight of pigeons came whirling through the air and alighted in the yard of Animal Farm in the wildest excitement. Jones is coming! The men are coming back! A whole lot of them! Six of them, all carrying big sticks! They've just come through the They're coming up the cart track now. Jones is at the head of them, and he's got his gun! Every animal to his post! Comrade Snowball takes command. And Snowball launched his first attack. But the men, with their hobnail boots, were too strong for them. At the signal for retreat, the animals fled into the yard, and the human beings, seeing, as they thought, their enemies in flight, rushed after them in disorder. Come on, boys. Now we got them. Drive them up into that there corner, and then we'll give them what for. Here, look out, there's a whole load more of them coming. Oh. 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 
At this moment, Snowball sprang his surprise. As soon as the men were well inside the yard, the three horses, the three cows and the rest of the pigs suddenly emerged in their rear, cutting them off. And so, within five minutes of their invasion, the human beings were in ignominious retreat by the same way as they had come, with a flock of geese hissing after them and pecking at their calves all the way. Snowball. Hooray! Hooray! My boxer was glorious. Did you see him rearing up on his hind legs and lashing out of them with his hooves? Uh, and Snowball, the way he charged straight at Jones and never stopped for an instant, even when Jones raised his gun and fired. But Snowball's wounded. The blood's running down your back, comrade. Nothing. A scratch. The pellets only grazed me. This battle must have a name, comrades. I suggest the Battle of the Cowshed. Yes. Agreed. 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 The Battle of the Cowshed. The Battle of the Cowshed. The Battle of the Cowshed. After the Battle of the Cowshed, Jones gave up hope of getting his property back and went to live in another part of the county. The animals were now secure in their possession of the farm. The neighbouring human beings did not hate them any less than before, but they had developed a sort of grudging respect for them, one symptom of which was that they now took to calling Animal Farm by its proper name and stopped calling it the Manor Farm. As winter drew on, Molly started to be late for work and to find excuses to go to the pond and gaze at her own reflection. One day Clover took her aside. Molly, I have something very serious to say to you. This morning, I saw you looking over the hedge at the neighbouring farm and allowing a man to stroke your nose. What does that mean? He didn't. I wasn't. It isn't true. <laughs> a thought struck Clover. She went to Molly's stall and turned over the straw with her hoof. There was a little pile of lump sugar and some coloured ribbons. Three days later, Molly disappeared. There were rumours that she had been seen between the shafts of a smart dog cart with her mane clipped and a ribbon round her forelock, looking very happy. None of the animals ever mentioned Molly again. In January, the frost and snow made it impossible to do much work in the fields, so there were many meetings in the big barn, and the work of the coming year was carefully planned out. It had come to be accepted that all questions of farm policy should be decided by the pigs. The vote was still taken, but the main decisions had always been made beforehand. The other animals thought this arrangement quite a reasonable one, but just occasionally... Boxer, do you remember how the cows were milked on the day of the rebellion? Yes, and I remember that when we came back in the evening, the milk had disappeared. It has disappeared every day since. Do you know what happens to it? I have just found out. It is mixed every day into the pig's mash. No other animal gets a drop of it. I do not think that's any concern of ours. What use is milk to a horse? Yes, but there are also the apples. When the orchard was picked, the apples were stored in the harness room. And now I hear that every one of them is to be kept for the pigs. What was that you were talking about, comrades? Ah, the milk and the apples. <laughs> Let me put that in its right perspective for you, comrades. Milk and apples, this has been proved by science, comrades. Milk and apples contain substances absolutely necessary to the well-being of a pig. We pigs are brain workers. 
It is for your sake that we drink that milk and eat those apples. Do you know what would happen if we pigs failed in our duty even for a single day? Jones would come back. Jones left this district after the Battle of the Cowshed. Yes, Jones would come back. Surely, comrades, surely there is no one among you who wants to see Jones come back. <sighs> Comrade Squealer's explanation seems to be quite satisfactory, Clover. Yes, Squealer is very good at explaining things. So the pigs continued to be the real controllers of the farm, and Napoleon and Snowball were their acknowledged leaders. But unfortunately, as winter wore on, the rivalry between these two became more acute. Indeed, at every meeting that was held... Silence! I will be heard! Comrade Napoleon! If you had even the most elementary knowledge of scientific farming... I am not interested in scientific farming. I'm a practical pig, and at least I know how to grow cabbages. Listen, I have looked this up in the farmer and stock breeder. I have the passage by heart. I will repeat it to you. On light soils... Have you noticed, Benjamin, that the sheep always break into that slogan when Snowball is speaking, never when Napoleon is speaking? Quite a coincidence, is it not? But of all the struggles between Snowball and Napoleon, none was so bitter as the struggle over the windmill. Think of it, comrades! Think what we could do if we had electricity on this farm! A chaff cutter, a mangle slicer, a milking machine, electric light in every animal stall. That's wonderful. Ah, oh, but it's so good to be true. It's impossible. Electricity can do anything. Let me tell you that if we had a dynamo and a windmill on the knoll, no animals on this farm need do more than two hours' work a day. Pay no attention to him. This is not a time to be filling our heads with dreams. We have a hard year's work ahead of us. Before all else, our output of food must be increased. When we have built the windmill, food production will increase 1,000%. And I say that if we waste time on this windmill of yours, we should all starve to death long before it is built. I wonder, I wonder. Only well, 12 hours work. It might be true. I've seen the plans of the windmill. Snowball has drawn them out in chalk on the floor of one of the sheds. He says it's all worked out down to the last detail. I wonder. Vote for Snowball and a 12-hour week. Vote for Napoleon and the full dinner pail. Vote for Napoleon. Vote for Snowball. Think of your stalls with hot and cold water and electric light. Every one of you could lie in bed till 10 o'clock in the morning. It's wonderful. Lie in bed till 10 o'clock. Vote for Snowball! Vote, Vote for, for Snowball! Guys, don't listen to these fairy tales he's telling you. Snowball, I warn you to be silent. I will not be silent. Comrades! Four legs good! Listen to me! Two legs bad! Four legs good! I will Two not be bad. shouted down. Comrades! Every animal who has the welfare of this farm at heart will vote for the windmill. Let us cast off the burden of the past, I tell you. Snowball, for the last time I warn you to sit down. I will not sit down. I... Then on your own head, be it. <whistles> <laughs> Nine enormous dogs, wearing brass-studded collars, dashed straight for Snowball. In a moment, he was out of the door and they were after him. He was running as only a pig can run, but the dogs were on his heels. One of them all but closed his jaws on Snowball's tail, but Snowball whisked it free just in time. Then he put on an extra spurt and slipped through a hole in the hedge and was seen no more. Silent and terrified, the animals crept back into the barn. These were the nine puppies whom Napoleon had taken from their mothers. They were huge, savage-looking dogs, and they kept close to Napoleon. Let every animal sit down and listen to me. 
Now that the traitor has been expelled from our midst, a new chapter in the history of the farm can begin. From today onwards, the Sunday meetings will be discontinued. They are unnecessary and a waste of time. What? No more meetings? Uh, 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 comrades. No, no, comrades. You will still assemble here on Sunday mornings to receive the orders for the week. But there will be no more debates. All questions relating to the working of the farm will be settled by a special committee of pigs, presided over by myself. And a very good arrangement, too. Think of all the brain work that will save you, comrades, not having to think for yourselves any longer. No more no, meetings. That's, that's not what Major said. Even Boxer was vaguely troubled. He set back his ears and tried hard to marshal his thoughts, but in the end he could think of nothing to say. Some of the pigs themselves, however, were more articulate. Four young porkers sitting in the front row sprang to their feet. Comrade Napoleon, I protest. You protest? Uh, yes. Uh, well, th that is to say... That... <coughs> well... Comrade, this is undemocratic. Uh, at, uh, at least it's precisely undemocratic, but, um... Obviously, Comrade, what, what you have done is strictly democratic, but I... Well, are you still protesting? No, Comrade, I have stopped protesting. Then the meeting is at an end. Oh, and one last word. Remember always that when there has been one rebellion, there can never be another. That is the just rule of rebellion. Comrades, comrades, before we part, I wish to propose a vote of thanks to Comrade Napoleon for his self-sacrifice in taking this extra labour upon himself. Remember, comrades, that it is for our sakes that he has chosen to bear this burden. Three cheers for our leader, Comrade Napoleon! Hooray! 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 So the Sunday meetings came to an end, and Napoleon reigned as the undisputed master of Animal Farm. I have a glorious piece of news for you. The windmill. You, you all remember our great leader Napoleon's project, which Snowball attempted to obstruct. The windmill is to be built after all. Work will begin tomorrow. I thought it was Snowball who wanted the windmill. No, 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 no. You, you have remembered it wrong, Clover. It was Comrade Napoleon's idea from the very start. But Snowball had the plans all drawn out on the floor of the sheds. Stolen. Stolen from among Comrade Napoleon's private papers. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, comrades, that Snowball was a mutineer. In fact, he was hardly better than a traitor, Muriel. He fought bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed, Squealer. Aye. Bravery is not enough, Comrade Boxer. Loyalty and obedience are more important. And as for the Battle of the Cowshed, I believe the time will come when we shall find that Snowball's part in it was very much exaggerated. But from today onwards, comrades, we must have only one thought. The building of the windmill. It will be a hard task, I warn you. It may even be necessary to reduce our rations at some time during the year. No matter. Once the windmill is built, there will be plenty of everything for everybody. I will work harder. We'll all work harder. Long live the windmill. Long live Comrade Napoleon. Long, Long live, live Comrade, Comrade Napoleon. Napoleon. Long, Long live, live Comrade, Comrade Napoleon. Napoleon. And how they worked right through that year. The hardest task was the breaking of the stone. Since the animals were unable to use picks and crowbars, the only way of doing it was to utilise the force of gravity. They lashed ropes round huge boulders on the floor of the quarry and then, all together, 
Cows, horses, sheep, any animal that could lay hold of the rope, even the pigs sometimes joined in at critical moments. With desperate slowness, they dragged them to the top of the quarry, where they were toppled over the edge to shatter to pieces below. Nothing could have been achieved without Boxer. His strength seemed equal to that of all the other animals put together. It was a noble sight to see him toiling up the slope, inch by inch, his breath coming fast, the tips of his hooves clawing at the ground and his great sides matted with sweat. In addition to his first motto of I will work harder, Boxer had now adopted a second. Napoleon is always right. He had also made arrangements with one of the cockerels to wake him in the morning half an hour earlier than the other animals, so that he could go down to the quarry and carry away an extra load of stone, unassisted. All through the summer the animals did not fare badly. And yet, from time to time, things still happened, which didn't actually cause murmurings, for somehow nobody felt inclined to murmur nowadays. There were too many dogs prowling about. Boxer, Muriel, yeah. have you heard what has happened? The pigs have moved into the farmhouse and are living there. Living what? in the farmhouse? Aye. Did we not pass a resolution never to live in the farmhouse? Yes. It was on the day of the rebellion. Was that resolution written down, Clover? No, it was not written down. But there is something else. Do you know that the pigs are not only living in the farmhouse, they have also taken to sleeping in the beds. <laughs> Benjamin... I want you to read one of the commandments for me. You know I never meddle in such matters. Oh, Muriel, you can read. Come with me to the end wall of the barn. There now. Read me the fourth commandment. Does it not say something about never sleeping in a bed? It says, No animal shall sleep in a bed ah. with sheets. With sheets? Oh, I'd forgotten about the sheets. We must have learned it wrong. With sheets? How strange. Yeah. Oh, shh, sure. shh, 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 shh. What was that you were saying, comrades? Ah, you have heard that we pigs are sleeping in the beds at the farmhouse. And why not? You didn't suppose, comrades, that there was ever a ruling against beds. A bed merely means a place to sleep in. A pile of straw in a stall is a bed, properly regarded. We have removed the sheets from the farmhouse beds and sleep between blankets. Mm. You wouldn't rob us of our repose, would you, comrades? You wouldn't have us too tired to carry out our duties. Surely none of you wishes to see Jones come back. No, 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 no don't no, let Jones, let Jones come back. No. By late autumn, the windmill was half built. In their spare moments, the animals would walk round and round it, marvelling that they should ever have been able to build anything so imposing. Only old Benjamin refused to show any enthusiasm, though, as usual, he would utter nothing beyond the cryptic remark that donkeys live for a long time. November came with raging southwest winds. Building had to stop because it was too wet to mix the cement. Finally, there came a night when the gale was so violent that the farm buildings rocked on their foundations and several tiles were blown off the roof of the barn. Towards morning... Napoleon paced to and fro in silence, occasionally snuffling at the ground. His tail had grown rigid and twitched sharply from side to side. Suddenly, he halted. Comrades! Do you know who is responsible for this? Do you know who has come in the night and overthrown our windmill? Snowball. No. I can smell his footprints in the grass. Snowball has done this thing. No! No! no. 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 Snowball? No, he couldn't. He couldn't be so wicked. Comrades, here and now I pronounce 
sentence of death upon Snowball. Half a bushel of apples to any animal who brings him to justice. A full bushel to anyone who captures him alive. And now, no more delays. There is work to be done. This morning, we begin rebuilding the windmill. And we will build all through the winter, rain or shine. We will teach this miserable traitor that he cannot undo our work so easily. Forward, comrades. Long live the windmill. Long live Animal Farm. So the rebuilding of the windmill was begun. It was a bitter winter. The stormy weather was followed by sleet and snow and then by a hard frost. The animals carried on as best they could with the difficult work, well knowing that the outside world was watching them. Suddenly, early in the spring, an alarming thing was discovered. Snowball was secretly frequenting the farm during the night. Yes, comrades. Almost every night he comes creeping in under cover of darkness. He steals the corn, he upsets the milk pails, he breaks the eggs, he gnaws the bark off the fruit trees. Comrade Napoleon has already made a most careful inspection of the premises and he could smell traces of snowball everywhere. So that was how the dairy window got broken. And that was how that drain at the bottom of the field got blocked up. And all that water came through the roof of the barn. Why did he fight so bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed? I, I saw him myself. He was wounded by Jones's gun. We all saw the blood running down Snowball's back. All part of the arrangement, comrade. Jones's shot only grazed him. The plot was for Snowball at the critical moment to give the signal for flight and leave the field to the enemy. And he very nearly succeeded. If it had not been for our heroic leader, Comrade Napoleon. No, 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 no. <laughs> But do you not remember how, just at the moment when Jones and his men had got inside the yard, Snowball suddenly turned and fled, and, and many animals followed him? Well, do you not remember that it was just at the moment when panic was spreading and all seemed lost that our leader, Comrade Napoleon, <laughs> sprang forward with a cry of... Death to humanity! And sank his teeth in Jones's leg? <laughs> Surely you remember that, comrades? It makes it all sound so real. I don't believe it's true. I believe it's true. Yes, it is true. We remember. I cannot believe that Snowball was a traitor at the beginning. But what he has done since is different. Our leader... Comrade Napoleon has stated categorically, categorically, comrade, that Snowball was Jones's agent from the very beginning. Yes, and long before the rebellion was ever thought of. Oh, that is different. If Comrade Napoleon says it, it must be right. Napoleon is always right. Uh, that is the true spirit, comrade. And now, one last word. Let me warn every animal on this farm to keep his eyes very wide open. For we have the strongest reasons for thinking that some of Snowball's secret agents are lurking among us at this very moment. Dogs, do your duty. <laughs> They were the same four pigs as had protested when Napoleon abolished the Sunday meetings. Have you anything to say before justice is done? Uh, 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 I, I wish to confess that I am a traitor to Animal Farm and worthy of any punishment that may be visited upon me. I have been the traitor Snowball's agent and accomplice since the time of the rebellion, and I have been secretly in touch with him ever since his expulsion. I confess also that I assisted him in destroying the windmill, and that I have entered into an agreement with him to betray Animal Farm into the hand hands of, of the human enemies. I, I, I wish to add that I, I, I did not commit these treacheries um, from, from any feeling of, of conviction. You are but... forgetting something, I think. Uh, 
Sorry, comrade, I, I lost the place. Um, I, uh, I, I admit also that Snowball revealed to me early in our association that he had been Jones' secret agent for many years before the rebellion and was employed by him as a spy and agent provocator, among the other animals. I, I wish to add that I did not commit these treacheries from any feeling of conviction, but in return for a bucket of pig meal secretly supplied to me by Snowball twice a week. I too. <laughs> and I. And I. And what is the appropriate punishment for these crimes? Death. 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 Death it shall be. <laughs> Has any other animal anything to confess? Has any other animal anything to confess? And so the tale of confessions and executions went on until there was a pile of corpses lying before Napoleon's feet and the air was heavy with the smell of blood. How many were killed altogether? Oh, I don't know. Ten? Fifteen? More? It is the first time that blood has been shed. Since Jones left, until today, no animal has killed any other animal. No. Not even a rat was killed. No. I do not understand it. Somehow the fault must lie in ourselves. Is it perhaps because we have not worked hard enough? From today onwards, I shall get up an hour earlier in the mornings. And Boxer moved off at his heavy, lumbering trot. But the other animals made their way slowly to the little knoll in the pasture where the half-finished windmill stood. And there, with one accord, they all lay down. As Clover looked down the hillside, her eyes filled with tears. I do not wish to rebel or disobey. I know the pigs are cleverer than we are. I will work hard. I will do whatever Napoleon tells me, but... But no, no, this is not what we intended. I think... I don't know what to, to think. Soon or late, the day is coming. Tyrant man shall be your throne. C comrades, silence! The silence, if you please! Comrades, I have to inform you that by a special decree of our leader, Comrade Napoleon, the song entitled Beasts of England is abolished. From now onwards, it is forbidden to sing it. What? Oh. Beasts of England abolished? Why is Beasts of England abolished, yeah. Squaler? Well, it is no longer needed, comrade. Beasts of England was the song of the rebellion, but the rebellion is now completed. The execution of the traitors this afternoon was the final act. The, the, the purpose of Beasts of England was to express our longing for a better society in days to come. But that society has now been established. Obviously, therefore, the song has lost its meaning. Yes, I suppose so. But, but uh, I am glad to tell you, comrades, that another song, a much more inspiring song, I may say, has already been composed to, to take the place of Beasts of England. <clears throat> it begins... Animal farm, animal farm, never through me shalt thou come to harm. That's half as good as Beasts of England. It doesn't seem fair. Why shouldn't we sing it if we want to? Four legs good, two legs bad. Four legs good, two legs bad. Four legs good, two legs bad. I thought we had taken a vow never to kill one another. <laughs> Muriel, read me the sixth commandment. Does it not say that no animal shall kill another animal? It says no animal shall kill 
any other animal without cause. Without cause? Mm. Oh, I'd forgotten that. Mm. Well, yes, there was cause enough. But what, what do you think of these happenings, Benjamin? I think donkeys live a long time. And one reason why they live a long time is that they never talk politics. But I think that if we all work harder, there will be more of everything for everybody, and then these things will not happen. I shall go down to the quarry and collect another load of stone. In the autumn, by a tremendous, exhausting effort, the windmill was finished. Tired out but proud, the animals walked round and round their masterpiece, which appeared even more beautiful than when it had been built the first time. Moreover, the walls were twice as thick as before. Nothing short of explosives would lay them low this time. Napoleon himself, attended by his dogs and his black cockerel, came down to inspect the completed work. He personally congratulated the animals on their achievement and declared that the mill would be named Napoleon Mill. Two days later, he announced that he had sold a pile of timber to the neighbouring farmer, Frederick. The pigs were in ecstasies over Napoleon's cunning. Frederick had wanted to pay for the timber with something called a cheque, but Napoleon was too clever for him. He had demanded payment in real five-pound notes. Three days later, a choking roar of rage sounded from Napoleon's apartments. It had been discovered that the banknotes were forgeries. Napoleon summoned the animals together. The death sentence is pronounced on the traitor Frederick. When captured, he will be boiled alive. We must expect the worst and be on our guard. The very next morning, the attack came. There were 15 men with half a dozen guns between them and they opened fire as soon as they got within 50 yards. The animals could not face the stinging pellets and took refuge in the farm buildings. Frederick and his men halted at the windmill. Two of them produced a crowbar and a sledgehammer. They were going to knock it down. Impossible! We have built the walls too thick. They could not knock it down in a week. Courage, comrades! Do you not see what they are doing? They're going to pack blasting powder into that hole. The windmill had ceased to exist. A mighty cry for vengeance went up and the animals charged forth. It was a savage, bitter battle. Several of them were killed and nearly everyone was wounded. But the men did not go unscathed either. And when the nine dogs of Napoleon's own bodyguard suddenly appeared, baying ferociously, panic overtook them and the next moment the enemy was running for dear life. The animals had won, but they were weary and bleeding. The sight of their dead comrades moved some of them to tears, and they halted in silence at the place where the windmill had once stood. Yes, it was gone. But Squealer, who had unaccountably been absent during the fighting, came skipping towards them, whisking his tail and beaming with satisfaction. Let us celebrate our victory! What victory? What victory, comrade? Have we not driven the enemy off our soil, the sacred soil of Animal Farm? But they have destroyed the windmill, and we had worked on it for two years. We will build another windmill. The enemy was in occupation of this very ground, and now, thanks to the leadership of Comrade Napoleon, we have won every inch of it back again. Then we have won back what we had before. That is our victory. The animals limped back into the yard. Boxer had lost a shoe and split his hoof, and he saw ahead of him the heavy labour of rebuilding the windmill once again. 
for the first time it occurred to him that he was eleven years old, and that perhaps his muscles were not quite what they had been. But when the animals heard Napoleon's speech congratulating them, it did seem, after all, that they had won a great victory. It was announced that the battle would be called the Battle of the Windmill, and a special gift of an apple was bestowed on every one of them. Boxer, have you heard that the pigs have taken to drinking alcohol? Impossible. It is forbidden by the commandment. Well, so I thought. But it seems they discovered some barrels of beer which Jones left behind in the farmhouse cellar. Now I hear every pig gets a ration of a pint of beer a day. <laughs> I am sure that the fifth commandment forbids the drinking of alcohol. No, Clover, it does not. Do you remember that twice before we found that we had learned one of the commandments wrong? Aye. Well, there is another. Yesterday I was reading the commandments over to myself. Now I thought the fifth commandment ran, No animal shall drink alcohol. But really it runs, No animal shall drink to excess. Ah, no animal shall drink to excess. But that explains everything. But who can imagine Comrade Napoleon drinking to excess? Mm. Well, I thought that I'd learnt the commandments so carefully. <sighs> How strange that there should be three of them that I remembered wrong. You will remember a lot more of them wrong before you've finished, Clover. They started rebuilding the windmill at once. Boxer's hoof was slow to heal, and the work was harder than ever, but he wanted to see the windmill finished before he retired. He was looking forward to his promised pension and the apple he would receive on public holidays. But late one evening, a pigeon brought a message. Boxer has fallen! He's lying on his side and can't get up! Boxer? How are you? It, it is my lung. It does not matter. I think you will be able to finish the windmill without me. Perhaps they will let Benjamin retire too and be a companion to me. But two days later, Benjamin arrived with a different message. Quick! Quick, come at once! They're taking Boxer away! There was a big closed van with lettering on its side and a man in a bowler hat sitting in the driver's seat. And Boxer's stall was empty. Goodbye, Boxer! Goodbye, Boxer! Fools! Fools, don't you see what's written on the side of the van? I? Hell? Hell? I'll read it for you. Alfred Simmons, horse slaughterer and glue boiler, dealer in hides and bone meal, kennel supplied... Do you understand what that means? They are taking Boxer to the knackers. No. No. Boxer! Boxer! Get out of the van quickly! But at this moment, the man on the box whipped up his horse and suddenly Boxer's face, with a white stripe down his nose, appeared for a moment at the little window in the back of the van. Boxer, get out! But the stupid brutes of horses that pulled the van wouldn't listen. Comrades, Boxer was never seen again. Three days later, Squealer announced that Boxer had died in the hospital at Willingdon. Comrades, I have dark and heavy news for you. Our old friend and comrade, Boxer, is dead. I was at his bedside to the last. Comrades, it was the most affecting sight that I have ever seen. At the end, almost too weak to speak, he whispered in my ear that his sole sorrow was to have passed on before the windmill was finished. Forward, comrades, he whispered. 
forward in the name of the rebellion. Long live Animal Farm. Long live Comrade Napoleon. Napoleon is always right. However, it has come to my knowledge that a most foolish and wicked rumour has been circulating. It appears that animals noticed that the van in which Boxer was removed was marked Horse Slaughterer, and they actually jumped to the conclusion that Boxer was being taken to the knackers. <laughs> Surely, comrades, surely you understand our leader, Comrade Napoleon, better than that. That van used to belong to the horse slaughterer, and it was bought from him by the veterinary surgeon. The old name has not yet been painted out. That is how the mistake arose. If it really was a mistake and not a slander deliberately circulated by some evilly disposed animal. And the following Sunday, Napoleon himself pronounced a short oration in Boxer's honour and said the pigs would hold a special banquet in his memory. And on the appointed day, a large wooden crate was delivered to the farmhouse and word went round that, somehow or other, nobody quite knew how, the pigs had got hold of the money to buy themselves a case of whiskey. Years passed. The seasons came and went. The short animal lives fled by. A time came when there was no one left who remembered the old days before the rebellion except Clover and Benjamin and a number of the pigs. Napoleon was now a mature boar of twenty-four stone. He was seldom seen in public, and when he did appear, it was always with a bodyguard of dogs and the black cockerel who marched in front of him, uttering shrill cock a doodle -doos. Squealer had grown so fat that he could, with difficulty, see out of his eyes. The farm had grown more prosperous, and the animals had multiplied. But life was no happier, or less happy, than it had been in the early days of the rebellion. Squealer's speeches, and very good speeches they were, proved by long lists of figures that everything was growing better and better. But the animals did not know. They could not remember. They were generally hungry, they slept on straw, they drank from the pool, they laboured in the fields, in winter they were troubled by the cold, and in the summer, by the flies. I know that things haven't turned out as we once hoped they would, Benjamin, but still it has been worth it. This farm is our own, our very own. The Republic of Animals that Major promised us, no, no, it hasn't happened. It may not happen in the lifetime of any animal now living. But yes, someday it will happen. That I do believe. Donkeys live a long time. The animals never gave up hope. More, they never lost, even for an instant, their sense of honour and privilege in being members of Animal Farm. If they went hungry, it was not from feeding tyrannical human beings. If they worked hard, at least they worked for themselves. No creature among them went on two legs. No creature called any other creature master. All animals were equal. One day, in early summer, Squealer ordered the sheep to follow him and led them out to a piece of waste ground at the other end of the farm, which had become overgrown with birch saplings. The sheep stayed there for a whole week, browsing at the leaves, and the other animals saw nothing of them. Squealer was with them for the greater part of every day. One evening, just after the sheep had returned from the waste ground, the animals were on their way back from work. When... What's up? What's happening? It's, it's Clover! 
Something's frightened her out of her wits. Come on, she's in the yard. <laughs> oh, look, 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 look. He's walking on his hind legs. He's just walking on his hind legs. It was a pig. Yes, it was Squealer. A little awkwardly, as though not quite used to supporting his considerable bulk in that position, he was strolling across the yard. And a moment later, out from the farmhouse came a long file of pigs, all walking on their hind legs. Some of them were a little unsteady and looked as though they would have liked the support of a stick. But every one of them made his way right round the yard successfully. And last of all... <gasps> it's Napoleon! It's Napoleon! It's Napoleon. Here comes Napoleon! Oh, he's got a whip! He's coming in the whip and he's trotting! Oh. Majestically upright, casting haughty glances from side to side, Napoleon marched right round the yard with his dogs frisking after him. The animals watched, too terrified at first to speak. It was as though their world had turned upside down. Four legs good, two legs better. 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 The sheep kept this up for several minutes, and by the time they had quietened down, the chance to utter any protest had passed for the pigs had marched back into the farmhouse. Benjamin felt a nose nuzzling at his shoulder. He looked round. It was Clover. Without saying anything, she tugged gently at his mane and led him round to the end of the big barn where the seven commandments were written. The two of them stood gazing at the tarred wall with its white lettering. Even when I was young, I could not have read what is written there. But it appears to me that that wall has changed. Are the Seven Commandments the same as they used to be, Benjamin? No, they are not the same. There is only one commandment written there now. Shall I read it to you? Yes, read it, Benjamin. It reads, All animals are equal... But some animals are more equal than others. I see. I see. After that, it did not seem strange when next day the pigs who were supervising the work of the farm all carried whips in their trotters. It did not seem strange to hear that the pigs had bought themselves a wireless set... It did not even seem strange when the pigs took Mr Jones's clothes out of the wardrobes and put them on, and when Napoleon was seen strolling in the farmhouse garden with a pipe in his mouth. A week later, in the afternoon, a number of dog carts drove up to the farm. A deputation of neighbouring farmers had been invited to make a tour of inspection. They were shown all over the farm and expressed a great admiration for everything they saw, especially the windmill. That evening loud laughter and bursts of singing came from the farmhouse. And suddenly, at the sound of the mingled voices, the animals were stricken with curiosity. With one accord, they tiptoed cautiously into the farmhouse garden and peeped in at the dining room window. Look, look, they're all sitting round the table together. Six pigs and six men, all sitting side by side. And Napoleon, sitting at the head of the table. Look how easily the pigs are sitting up in their chairs, just like human beings. They've been playing cards. I suppose they've stopped for another drink. Look how easily Napoleon holds his beer mug in his trotter. Now they're filling up their mugs again. Oh, look, that farmer's standing up. <gasps> He's going to make a speech. <laughs> gentlemen, now, gentlemen, I just want to say 
how happy it makes me to see the twelve of us. Now, how shall I put it? All sorts and conditions, as you might say, <laughs> sitting round this table together with old scores buried and forgotten. Because it ain't no use denying, as there was a time when some of us, not me, mind you, no one ever said that of me, <laughs> uh, when some of us wouldn't have sat down at this table <laughs> and wouldn't have been invited to neither. <laughs> there was a time when this farm wasn't well thought of in the neighbourhood. And why? Well... It was due to what you might call a misunderstanding. A natural one, I think we got to admit. It was thought, that's to say, some folks thought, as a farm run on these lines would set a kind of bad example and start putting ideas into the other animals' heads all over the county. <laughs> it was even thought, and I won't say as the idea wasn't natural enough, that the animals on a farm like this wouldn't be kept under the way they ought to be. <laughs> because every farmer knows that animals, and when I say animals, gentlemen, I mean the lower animals, mm. and no reflection on our roasts <laughs> at this table. Animals have got to be kept under with a firm hand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, gentlemen... How happy we all must be to know that them ideas were root and branch mistaken. <laughs> we know now, if we didn't know before, as Mr Napoleon there is not the one to go putting ideas into the lower animals' heads. <laughs> I believe I'm within my rights in saying that the animals on this farm do more work and get less food than the old county. And who could ask better than that? <laughs> I say, therefore, that if anyone, uh, not me, mind you, has entertained ideas hostile to this farm, let him put them away and regard Mr Napoleon for what he is, a public benefactor. Ah. Ah. Uh, now, gentlemen, I know we're all anxious to get back to that uh, pleasant game of cards as we were enjoying just now. I will therefore cut my remarks short and propose that toast as I spoke to you of. Uh, uh, them glasses all full. Uh, 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 then, to the prosperity of Hannibal Farm. Ah. Look, Napoleon standing up. Now he's going to make a speech too. I shall not detain you for more than a few moments. I wish merely to express my warm thanks on behalf of the farm for the very neighbourly speech to which we have just listened oh, and to associate myself with the friendly sentiments that were expressed in it. No one is more happy than I am that the period of suspicion and misunderstanding should have come to an end. In the past, there have been rumours circulated, I have reason to think, by some malignant enemy. Of all. Yep. There was something subversive and even revolutionary in the outlook of myself and my colleagues. Nothing could be further from the truth. Of course. Our sole wish now, as always, is to live at peace with our neighbours. And I think you will find, gentlemen, when business relations have been fully established, that we are well able to compete with you on your own terms. <laughs> this farm, I may add... It's a cooperative enterprise. The title deeds, which are in my own possession, are owned by the pigs, jointly. And now, gentlemen, I only have one small criticism to make of that excellent speech which we heard just now. My neighbour referred all the way through to Animal Farm. He could not know, for I'm only now announcing the fact for the first time, that the name Animal Farm has been abolished. Henceforth, this farm will be known by what I believe was its true and original name, the Manor Farm. Oh. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen. What's happening? The same Something's happening to their faces. Fill your glasses to the brim, gentlemen. And here is my toast to the prosperity of the Manor Farm. <laughs> Manor Farm. They finished the speeches. Cards again. Look at Napoleon dealing the cards. How neatly he does it. 
just like a human being. But what's happening to the faces of the pigs? What's happening? What's happening? I think they're fighting. How come that other ace of spades is, is on the table? Yeah. Uh, what, you know as no well way. as I do, there's only one ace in the pile. Ah, How many no more way. of them no, you got no, keep no, hidden? No, come on, no, 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 turn out your pockets and let's have a look. How dare you suggest a spit in my... The quarrel continued. There was shouting, banging on the table, sharp, suspicious glances, furious denials. The eyes of the animals outside flitted from one face to another. Some of them had five chins, some had four, some had three. But what was it that seemed to be melting and changing in the faces of the pigs? It started to happen when he said, the manor farm. Tell me, Benjamin, is it really happening? Or is it only because my eyes are growing so dim? No, Clover, There's nothing wrong with your eyes. It is happening. Twelve voices were shouting in anger. And they were all alike. No question now what had happened to the faces of the pigs. The creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again. But already it was impossible to say which was which. In Animal Farm, the narrator was Tanzin Gregg. Napoleon was played by Nicky Henson, Squealer by Toby Jones, Snowball by Patrick Brennan, and Major by Robert Blythe. Boxer was Ralph Ineson, Clover, Liza Sadovy, Benjamin, Paul Stonehouse, Muriel, Sarah Tom, and Molly, Lizzie Watts. Other parts were played by Eleanor Crooks, Ben Crow, Will Howard, Gerard McDermott, Adam Nagaitis, and Stephanie Racine. The musical director was Neil Brand. Animal Farm was adapted from his own novel by George Orwell. The director was Alison Hindle.